and turn to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 6. Uh, I'm Mark Emerson, and uh, you heard about me last week, but uh, our elders have uh, asked that I uh, serve with you all for the next uh, period of time during the transition while we search for a pastor. And so um, I know that the word interim pastor is new to a lot of folks, and so what you need to understand, he's temporary, all right? He's not the candidate for, uh, for uh, the next pastor. He's a guy that wants to help uh, that process. He wants to help you. I do want to help you. I want to meet you. And uh, I want to be able to uh, walk through this period with you all. And I know it's, this is an awkward time for the church. And, and anytime um, you know, I begin an interim pastorate, that is also awkward. So uh, welcome to all of our awkwardness together. Amen. Amen. I do want to meet you, and uh, I'll be standing outside uh, after the worship service as you guys leave, and would love to shake your hand, love to get to know your name. Here's what I would love to have, and if so, if the Lord lays this on your heart, and you want to serve as, uh, in this uh, position today, that'd be great. I would love to have somebody that's really outgoing say, I'm going to help the guy out. I'm going to go out in the hallway. I'm going to stand right there next to him, and when somebody comes up, I'm going to say, is name's George, all right? Things like that that would be good to help me, all right, in the process. So if the Lord lays that on your heart, I would love to be able to have you to do that today as we stand out there afterwards, okay? Uh, also, uh, I'd love to talk to you. And so if you want to talk to me, let me give you my contact information. So everybody get out a, uh, a pen real quick. And I realize that this is going all over Facebook, but my, my cell phone number is on Facebook anyway. So that's, all, that's okay. So uh, here's how you can get a hold of me. Uh, my cell phone number 217 uh, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2
They had a couple in their youth group, two girls in their youth group, that knew better but were out on the water uh, one particular day on a raft. And they were just sunning on the raft, but they fell asleep on the raft. And when they woke up, they were terrified because they no longer could see the shore. Now, these were people that grew up around the water, and it, it maybe it's a little less frightening because of, because of that. You and I, we, we wouldn't make it that far. We probably wouldn't be on the raft. But they woke up, and they couldn't, they couldn't see the shore. And so they spent the entire day out to sea until they were rescued by the Coast Guard, isn't that amazing, later that night. And when I heard him share that story, I began to, to say, you know, that's exactly what the Christian life could be and maybe is a, a lot of times for, for you and I, where we find ourselves, you know, in a position where uh, because of where we are, the, the nice weather, the nice waves, the nice raft, we find ourselves slumbering on the raft and then don't realize that we're being able to be drifted away from our, from our main course. And I want you to see that that is, is so common, and it's what happened in our passage today. These were the people of God, but they got really far away from the place that God wanted them to be in the very center of his will. They drifted away. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, uh, the writer of Hebrews shares this challenge to us. It says, he says, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we will not drift away. So this morning as we leave, what I would love for us to be able to see is, is, is where are we at right now in the beginning of 2023 in our relationship to the Lord? Are we on center or has there been drift in our walk with the Lord and have this great opportunity even today that the Holy Spirit would recalibrate our walk with him so that we can get ourselves back to where God would ask us to be. So if you had your Bible and you, and you have it open with you, would you stand in honor of the reading of the Lord's uh, word? We're going to read that. Uh, I'll read that to you, but I'd love uh, for us all to stand as we do that. Uh, Judges chapter 6, we're going to be 1 through 11. I'm going to read out of the NIV today because of uh, the need for us for the very first word in the passage, and we'll get to that while that's important. Judges 6, 1 through 11. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's important. I'll read that again. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord, for help. Let's pause. Very positive passage so far. Amen. Yeah. Look at verse 7. When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, you think it's going to get better. It's not getting any better. All right. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of your oppressors. I drove them before you and gave you the land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in the land you live, but you have not listened to me. Let's pray. Wow, Lord, that is, that is a lot to take in first thing on a Sunday morning. But Lord, I pray today that as we look at uh, the pattern of rebellion in the lives of the Israelites during this time, 
And Father, that you give us the opportunity of taking uh, a look into our own life. So Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would just be so strong this morning in our worship time. And Father, that you'd speak to every heart that's here and there'd be a great recalibration even at the end of this message, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. I noticed that we did have the outline uh, today, and so many of you uh, maybe have that in your, uh, in your possession. Here's another thing that Mark is going to stress you during this time, is that I'm going to leave out uh, important blanks in your sheet. And if you are have a personality that can't leave the worship without all the blanks filled in, uh, man, I'm going to bother you. And so uh, what you're going to do when you get to that is you can come up to me and you're like, man, I'm, I'm missing three blanks. What are the blanks? Or, or you might say, hey, text me, text me the entire thing. And I'd be happy to give you all of the documents. I just want to forewarn you. I'll get so excited about some stuff and you're going to miss something. You're going to, oh, my land. So, uh, uh, Give me grace as if I, if I miss something, all right? Give me grace with that. But I, if you're taking notes today, I would love for you to kind of look at your note page and, and, and offer three places to write some things down because there's three places in this story that I think that we need to visit to, uh, in order for us to catch very deeply what's happening here in the Word, all right? So I know pastors love threes, right? But today especially, there's three things for us to walk on. I'm going to give you a key word for every, uh, every section that we go to and so that you make sure that we're all on the same page. But what you saw in this passage is something that has been happening all through the book of Judges. You see, after uh, Joshua's reign, remember uh, Moses handed the leadership over to Joshua. Joshua led the people into uh, the promised land and they were conquering land, most of the land. There was work left to be done even after Joshua. But at the end of Joshua's uh, kind of leadership, there was really no identified leader afterwards. There was a leadership void that happened between Joshua and then these judges that are coming up. And as you open up the book of the Judges, you're going to see a phrase that's offered several times. I think it's already offered five times before it's offered right here in the midst of uh, this, that the people are going to do evil in the, in the eyes of the Lord. Without a leader, what was happening with this group of people is they were basically doing, doing what uh, they saw be best as described in their own eyes. So they were the ones that were giving kind of leadership. Everybody was doing his, their, own, their own thing. And there was this massive drift of the people from the center of where God wanted them to be to where they ended up, all right? And so there was this cycle, this pattern that was happening within uh, this group. And let me just describe the pattern to you really quick, all right? So the first thing that was happening was this, this idea of, of drift. People were doing what was right in their own eyes, okay? They were, they were drifting away, all right? They they, they were doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so they would drift away from the center of God. And then what God was doing is God, uh, next thing, that, that he, he just stepped away. All right, look, uh, God does not make you follow him. All right? He does not shackle you to a relationship with him, to, this, uh, to his perfect will. I mean, if you want to walk away, you're walking away. If you want to, you want to, you want to uh, choose an, another God, you know, he's not, he's not going to, he's not going to make you follow him. In fact, uh, uh, God will give you over to that thing that you have chosen for your deliverance. And what was happening, the drift, is they were following after Canaanite gods. They were following after uh, their own kind of pleasures. They were, they, were leaving, they were leaving the Lord. And what the Lord did, the Lord uh, took his hand of protection off of them. And the Midianite army, as you would see, up to this time, the largest and fastest army that had ever amassed upon the planet. And they entered into Israel not with the understanding that they were going to hold it. Did you notice this? They weren't going to hold it. They were just going to control it. So what they did is they wiped it out and then went home. And then this became a seasonal deal. <laughs> when they uh, recovered from this devastation, they... Midianite army would visit them again and wipe them out. And notice this, as ugly as you can see, it killed everything. <laughs> they burned everything. They destroyed everything. They're killing everything. There is not a family in Israel at this time that did not uh, have some kind of loss because of the Midianite army. There was disaster everywhere they went. So drift into disaster. 
Boy, if we had a, uh, a kind of a testimony time at this point in our message, we're like, man, I've been there. I've drifted away, and I got into this, and when I got into this, there was disaster. I, I, I ruined my marriage. I ruined my job. I ruined my reputation. I mean, it, it's, I just, a disaster came upon me. Well, the, after the disaster, there's another cycle, and after the disaster, there's this, this crying out. There's this repentance that people call out to the Lord. And God is faithful to hear them and brings apart this, uh, this restoration of the people. The problem is, this is happening over and over and over and over again. So in the first part of our message this morning, I want to identify this, this drift and why this drift and what happens and, and if you and I have been a part of that in our own life, okay? So uh, point number one is the, is the drift. And the scripture opens up in the first verse of the passage. It says, again, the Israelites did even uh, evil in the eyes of the Lord. And we're going to take that apart bit by bit. And I looked up the meaning of the word drift in, uh, in the dictionary. And one of the best definitions that I found was this one. It said, to slowly move away from the preferred location with no control over direction. So, uh, to give the Israelites credit here, they didn't just say, we're leaving you, Lord. We're packing our bags and we're going away. This thing was a slow process. They slowly walked away from their relationship with, with, with the Lord. And, and I don't know what it looked like for them, but man, I can, man it's convicting to me. You, if, if you would walk through my life, there'd be times in my life that I can show you that, man, I just started going through the motions of the Christian life and I, and I just walked away. I just walked away from stuff and, and, and the drift was real, real for me. It was real for them. They were drifting away from things to other things. Now, this is a blank, I think, on your, on your page. But uh, often when we think about drifts, we think about the obvious and what's happened here. They drifted from the good to the bad. And I don't know why they would do that. But they drifted from God to the, from the, Lord, the Lord God to the Canaanite God. They, they drifted from the protection of the Lord to the destruction of the Midianites. They, they left something that was really, really good for something that was really, really bad. And before you stand up and you say, man, that had never happened to me, there would be people, I think, that would stand up in the room and say, oh, it totally happened to me. I drifted away from something that was so good to something that was so awful, and I should have never done it. I remember a guy called me up on the phone after he had literally blown up his family, blown up his family because of his, because, of his, because of his behavior. And the behavior was this long period of drift from his wife and his kids to somebody else. And he called me up on the phone and he said, he said to me, I mean, this is the, uh, the weekend, the whole thing blew up. And he said to me, he said, Pastor Mark, I just want it all back. What have I done? I just want it all back. He drifted away from the good to the bad. But let me scare you to death. <laughs> Sometimes the drift isn't from the good to the bad. If, if Satan can't get you to leave the good for the bad, sometimes Satan will allow you to leave or convince you to leave the best for the good. The best for the good. How does the devil keep you away from the very center of the will of God? Give you something good to focus on instead of the best thing for you. Man, that's convicting. Look in your life and say, man, has that been me? I've been enjoying this particular thing, but not this thing. Remember when Mary and Martha were sitting with Jesus and Martha was fixing meatloaf in the, uh, in the, in, in the kitchen? And uh, Martha, or Mary was sitting at the couch listening listen to Jesus. And Martha's like, Jesus, tell her to come in here and help me. We got corn to make, man. We got mashed potatoes and gravy to make. And, 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 and she's not, she not helping. And remember, remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, Martha, Martha, Martha. That's a great verse. Martha, Martha. He says, why are you worrying about so many things? Uh, Mary has chosen the best thing. It will not be taken from her. So look, making meatloaf for Jesus is a good thing, all right? All right? But sitting, sitting, sitting in the feet of Jesus and listening to Jesus is the best 
is the best thing. Have you drifted? Have you sacrificed or have you substituted your service for the kingdom of God instead of a relationship with the kingdom of God? Have you substituted your identity of where you attend or what you do in that place for your relationship with Jesus? Have you substituted the good for the best? That's convicting for me. And then there's a third one. We drift from God to me. You drift from a God-centered life to a you-centered life where you are in charge, where you are setting the direction. And then your whole spiritual life then begins to be judged by the things that you want, your preferences or your, of your own uh, desires. We get together and we make decisions as a church and you judge all of those decisions based upon how it makes you feel instead of how it makes God feel. I'll tell you what, I, I go to a lot of churches and folks, there's a lot of churches that will um, you know, come and shake your hand and this would be a good sign not, what not to say to the pastor when you leave today. They'll say things like, man, I enjoyed that. <laughs> don't ever say that. Don't say you didn't enjoy it, but don't say you did because it makes them feel like a game show host, all right? Or, uh, or, or, or man, I've been, there. I've been there when they say, I didn't get a lot out of that. <laughs> and, and you're like, well, <laughs> it really wasn't for you. <laughs> If you didn't like the worship today, I want you to say, I'm going to get, let Bobby off the hook here today because if you don't enjoy the worship today, it's, it's, it wasn't designed for you. I hope not. I hope you didn't look through and try to get the top 10 of what we like to sing or the top 10 of who sings the best or all these other things to do so that we can present something to y'all and make a really good thing. No way. We designed something. We want to worship God, not us. The drift is so real and it's so convicting. And they drifted away. Let me give you three truths by this. Number one, every believer has the potential to drift away from God's perfect plan for their lives. It doesn't mean that they lose their salvation. Hang on to that. But they easily lose their way. I stood in, in a church service and it was very convicting because the guy that was preaching looked around the church and he said, uh, the saddest thing about church today is that um, within a year, there are people who are in the room who will not be serving the Lord at all. And I'll tell you what, when somebody does that, you know what the natural reaction in a Baptist church is? Everybody's like, <laughs> it's totally like that. And that is so true here. Do not think that we're above the drift. All of us have a potential to drift. Let me give you another one. God sets the standard. Morality is not set by the culture or crowdsourcing. Look what the passage says that's very convicting to us. The Bible says here in the first verse, it says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Church, what did they do? They did evil. Let me hear you say it. What did they do? They did evil. Now, we don't know what they did. I can make some kind of scholarly uh, guess that it was the worship of the Canaanite Baal God or some other thing, all right? But we don't know what they did, but we do know what it was recorded as. It was recorded as evil. They did evil. And, and, and how do we know it was evil? Because they all got together and they said, well, man, that thing that we're doing, that, man, that must be evil. No, it was God's standard. They did evil who in the eyes of the Lord. That's how it works. That's how the drift works. The drift works when people get together and say, well, that's, that's really not evil. Man, that used to be evil. That's not evil anymore. I mean, it's, I mean, it's okay now, this kind of thing. Like we have this idea of setting this progressive standard of, 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 of sin. And the reality is that God is the standard. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Let me give you one more. They had potential reasons for their drift. Look at what's happening in the, in the, in the midst of these, of these folks. First of all, uh, they had a huge leadership vacuum. So when there's no leader, there's an opportunity for a drift. I hope that, hit, I hope that hits home. <laughs> uh, if Satan goes and fights churches, what is Satan very actively fighting churches? The Satan is very actively fighting churches in a transition when there's a leadership vacuum. All right, Don't be surprised by that. Um, if that's a part of your Sunday morning drive conversation, man, there's a lot of things going on in our church right now. You know why? Satan attacks churches in a time of a leadership vacuum. He does. 
He does that. He's, 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 he's focused on that. They had a leadership vacuum right here in, their, uh, in the Israelites. And what they chose to do, they drifted. All right? Second thing is happening here. There was spiritual apathy. And the spiritual apathy, I think, came because it was a 40-year period of peace. There were some ugly things happened in chapter 5, but one of the products of some of the ugly that happened in chapter 5 was there's this 40-year time of, of peace. And in, in times of peace and prosperity, sometimes, sometimes we, we, get, we become apathetic in the spiritual life. We, we become bitter. We become, we become uh, 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 cynical. We become critical. And, and, and I'll tell you what, in those times we drift. And another thing, I think they became spiritually bored. Let me give you something for free. If you've entered into 2023 and you are spiritually bored, let me help you to not get bored. If you're bored doing this thing for the Lord, we'll work with the elders to give you something else to do. We want you not to be bored. We want you to be able to, to have a new adventure in 2023 so that you can get back. To, it could be exciting again uh, 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 for you. How do I get through it? I um, drive a lot of places with my GPS, and so do you. It's a natural part of our life. It doesn't do this hardly anymore if you're using your iPhone. But do you remember the day when we had uh, these other things, these Tom Toms or what some other things that we used to have, big wires plugged into your phone? Do you remember what would happen when you would get off course with some of those early GPSs? It'd yell at you, remember? It'd yell at you. And what would it yell when you would get off course? It would, it would, it would all go kind of crazy. It kind of still does that now with you. It kind of goes really crazy. And then it yells out a word to you and just to tell you it's working on something. Here's the word, recalibrating. So if we've drifted, and I really want you to not look at your neighbor. I want you to look at yourself and all this and say this. I mean, if, I'm, if, I've, if I've drifted, how do I get back? Recalibrate. Recalibrate. Even right now, in the middle of the message, God, I want, I want back. I want back in, your, in, in the center of your will. God so much wants you back that he'll take you back, recalibrate, recalibrate to the Lord, recalibrate to God. If it's been a while that you've heard the voice of God, very quickly, go back to the last place that you heard God say something to you and go do that thing. Wherever it was. Say, God, here's that place. What do I need to do? What do I do? How did I get off? How did I get off uh, path? Get back to the Lord. After a vacation with my family years ago, uh, we spent lots of days together in St. Louis, and my wife was mad at me when we got back. We had two little girls, and she was upset. And I, and I said to her, I said, why are you upset? She says, because you weren't with us the entire, the entire time. And I, and I just paused with that because that was kind of hard for me. I said, uh, I hope I'm not killing the TV people. I said this, I said, I said, I was totally there. <laughs> Guys, are you with me? I was totally there. <laughs> I mean, a drove. <laughs> there wasn't a thing they did that I wasn't there. We went to the magic house, put our hand on the little thing, made the hair go up. We did that. We went up in the arch. We ate at the spaghetti shop. I mean, all the things that we did, I was there. And, and, and I said, how could you say that? I was totally there. And she says, you were physically present, but you were not present with us. I had to recalibrate. I had to say to the Lord, Lord, make me present. Made me present with my family. I wonder how many times the Lord says that to me. Man, you're doing all these things, but your heart's not here. The drift. Quickly, here's the second thing. Scene two. So what he says in the, in the, in the passage, go back up to the scripture. Uh, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. We're still in verse one. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of, of the Midianites. If you underline things in your Bible, go ahead and underline that phrase. He gave them into. If you are here today and you don't underline things in your Bible, grab the Bible of the person next to you and underline their Bible. Okay? All right? He gave them into. Because of the drift, what the Lord did is he gave them to the Midianites. 
that's very picturesque to what was happening in the passage. And we're going we're gonna to kind of have a problem with that because we're like, God, how could you do that? And I want to give you three truths from that. Here's number one. If you are not desiring God, God will give you over to the thing that you are desiring. If you're not desiring God, if God is not your Savior, and you're looking to your job to be your Savior, what God will do is he says, all right, <laughs> I'll give you to your job. If you are uh, looking for your, your bank account to be your Savior, all right, <laughs> I'll give you over that and see what you can get from that. If you're looking for your, uh, your relationships to be your Savior, all right, <laughs> You want to follow that, I'll give you over to that. And let me tell you, those outcomes aren't good. Leviticus chapter 26, 21 says, If you remain hostile towards me and refuse to listen to me, I will multiply your afflictions seven times over as your sins deserve. I think we have this idea in the Christian life that because we are, and many of us have a relationship with Jesus, and because we have this relationship with Jesus, that man, man even, if it, even if we get off course, it's not, gonna, it's not too bad for us. And I want you to know that the wages of sin is death. All sin. All sin. Something dies every time we sin. We get off track with the Lord. Something is dying. Something is, something is not alive as it used to be. Something is not, as, is not as fulfilled as we used to be. Something is not as blessed as we used to be. We're leaving that process. And I want you to see number two of this is that God giving you over is a sign of his discipline, and you totally get that, but is also a sign of his grace. God loves you so much. So much that he would do anything in his power to help you to be able to come back in the very center of his will. Now, it's hard to read the Old Testament passage and see that, especially when I kind of showed you the description of the destruction that they went through. But I want you to see, because God loved the people of Israel so much, he gave them over to the Midianites. Let me say that again. Because God loved Israel so much, he gave them over to the Israelites. Why? Because he so wanted them back in a perfect relationship with him. He took his hands away so, they, so that they could come back. I mean, that's dangerous. I know. Sometimes as a parent, you ever get there as a parent? That we're, we're so protective of our kids at times that, that, that we've, never, we've never taught them. We've never taught them, uh, you know, how to, how to kind of operate on their own. And we, we take our hand back. We know that there's a, a possibility of a bad decision getting made. And we take our hand back and we watch it happen. And how, how heart, heartfelt that is for us and hurtful it is for us when, we, when that happens. God does that to us. And I want you to see the response to that threefold in this passage. Okay, go back to the devastation. I mean, they devastated everything. And the response to that is kind of interesting. Because first of all, we see that, uh, that this thing happened for how long? Did you see that in Scripture? Uh, a couple of days for a season. This thing happened for seven years. And because it was this annual type of event, we see, well, how come it took them so long? Because the initial response of the people of God to what was happening to them was a delay. They stayed, they stayed in it. Isn't that crazy? So this devastation happened, and it began to be an annual event for seven years. It took them seven years to call out to the Lord. The response was delay. And second thing, not only was it delay, but I, I want you to see that uh, the, the, other, the other awful thing about, about the is that uh, uh, they denied it. <laughs> so instead of turning to the Lord in this seven-year annual thing, look what they did. The Bible says that they made caves to hide out because of the devastation of the Midianites. Isn't that crazy? So instead of coming back to the Lord, what they, what they did is they delayed it. I'm not coming back yet. Midian's bad. But it's not really that bad, is it? For seven years, they stayed there. 
And then instead of coming back to the Lord, they denied it. They, they, they hid in caves. They were destroyed. Their lives were destroyed in this long period of time before they turned back to God. They weren't coming back from their stubbornness of their drift, from their saying, it's got to be my way. I, I, I can't turn it over to the Lord. I mean, if I turn it over to the Lord, everybody will know that I did that. Everybody will know that, that I, was, I was wrong and that my pride will keep me back from turning back over to the Lord. And they remained in this destruction for years and years and years and years and years. For seven years, catch this, the familiarity of their sin and its destruction became their identity. For change to truly come, please write this down somewhere. Grab a piece of paper. If you don't have paper, write it on the person's hand next to you. Then take them to the office copy machine, all right? For change to truly come, write this down. The pain to stay the same must become greater than the pain to change. So with losses in their family for seven years of destruction, hiding out in the cave, they still didn't have enough pain to say, I gotta live a different life. Are you there in 2023 in your life? Are you done? Are you done with that? You're like, man, this is, there's gotta be a better way. <laughs> I've, I've, I've done all of this. Got to be a better way. <laughs> this, is, this is awful. I'm turning back to the Lord. Are you done? Are you done with the old way? Are you ready to come back to the Lord? I mean, are you done? Or are you, are you positioning yourselves? No, man, I'll be all right. <laughs> Give me another year like I had last year. It's okay. Bring it on. It's all right. Okay. I don't, the emptiness, all of that. I mean, aren't you ready to be done? Aren't you ready to surrender? They didn't surrender to the Lord. Here's number three. Finally. The number three. Look at verse uh, chapter seven. Finally, at the end of all this mess in verse seven, we have this great phrase, the Israelites cried to the Lord. But the ugliness of this cry never gets good in this passage, never gets good in this. They cried out to the Lord, but I want you to look and see the last part of that phrase. The Israelites cried to the Lord because of why? Because of their sin? No, they cried to the Lord because of the Midianites. And they gather together and have this prayer meeting before the Lord. You see that? They gather together, have this prayer meeting to the Lord. And the Lord, I think, sends like a Scott Harris type of preacher to come up, you know, because he preached fire to them. But look at this deal. I'll give you three things. Number one, uh, this was not repentance. Don't think they repented. They were sorry not because of their sin. They were sorry because of what? They were done with Midian. They weren't done with disobedience. They were done with Midian. They were, they were sorry because of the situation. They weren't sorry because of their sin. This wasn't repentance. In Isaiah 29, 13, the Bible says, These people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And God answers by giving them this prophet, this prophet. We don't know his name. This is not the main, this is, this is not the main, this is not Gideon. This is a prophet. This unknown prophet shows up in this prayer meeting. And did you, did you get a hold of his ugly message that he offered? Let, let me read the ugly message that he had. Uh, in verse 8, uh, he sent a prophet who said, get this, this is ugly. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Now I want you to play along with me, all right? Every time we hear the word I or me, I'm going to pause and I want you to say that with me. All right, so let's practice with our I. Preaching is so much fun when we preach together. All right, so here it is. Sent in the prophet who said, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Are you ready? I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of your oppressors. Let's do it again. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I, stay with me, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land that you live, but you have not listened to me. So what was the focus of the prophet's message? The prophet walked them through and said, hey, let's remember how you got into this situation. You drifted from God's deliverance 
into this and you remain here for seven years of pain. And why'd you do it? You did it because, because you didn't listen to me. In Psalm chapter 81, and I want to end with this. Psalm chapter 81, verse 13. It says, oh, that my people would listen to me. That Israel would walk in my ways. Can we just pause right now and would you just bow your heads and close your eyes wherever you are in this mess? Don't, don't worry about the next thing or getting ready for worship even, guys. Just, let's just pause for a moment. And I just want you to have a real, real type of, of moment that we get along with the Lord. Because we had to go from verse 1 through verse 11 to see the bad because next Sunday when we come back, we get to see verse 12. And verse 12 is we get to see the angels showing up for a guy named Gideon to bring a deliver to deliver the people of Israel out of this mess and to wipe away this largest amassed army, this <laughs> biggest army that's ever gotten together on the planet, and God's going to take them out with 300 guys. I, all that is good stuff. But from, before we get to verse 12, we've got to get to verse 11, and we say, hey, look, here's why it happened. Why it happened, because of our own sin. Now, here's good news, folks. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it said that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In our drifting from the Lord, in our drifting from, from his perfect plan for us, in his grace, the Lord, the Lord has given us Jesus. Jesus is the deliverer. And you might be able to stand up and you might say, you know, Pastor Mark, this whole thing about the Midian, it, it's, it's, it's nothing compared to the devastation that I have faced in my own life as I've walked away from the Lord. And I want to say this. I want to say, praise God, there's a deliverer. His name's Jesus. And you can be redeemed even in, the, even in that situation. God can bring you back. God can restore you into that. you got to see the ugly before you can see the holy. And I want you this morning to be able to see your ugly. See your ugly. So bow your head and close your eyes and just go before the Lord and say, Lord, would you share with me my ugly? Would you share with me how far that I have strayed from you? Would you share with me the length of the drift? Have you, will you share with me of the years that I've kind of walked away? I've substituted stuff from you. I've drifted from the good to the bad. I've drifted. Lord, I've accepted the good from the best. Lord, I have substituted all of these things from this vibrant relationship with the Lord. I have drifted from you to me, God, and this morning I need to come back. And Jesus is what gets us back. So as the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about your drift, would you just right there before the Lord say, Lord, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Lord, I'm recalibrating. I need the Spirit of God to recalibrate my relationship with the Lord. I want back in my relationship with Jesus. I want back. I want back. Bobby, I'm going to ask that you guys go ahead and prepare this morning because I want to uh, have an opportunity for us to lead in a song. So where are you at? I want to pray over us in this situation. And I'm going to ask that uh, even, even right now that you continue in this moment where your, your chair is your, is, your, uh, is, your, is your prayer altar to the Lord. And I want you to do is the best that you can to get rid of everybody else in the room by just staying in the presence of the Lord and speaking to the presence of the Lord. And you might say something like this, God, I need to come back. I need to come back. Would you reveal to me in my life where it was, where I was, uh, I was in the center of your will, God. I, I need to get back there. And maybe even this morning, you're feeling pretty strong in your relationship with the Lord. And you might say, but look, I've, there's a lot of things that I have substituted good instead of his best. And I want to be, be in the very center of what the Lord wants. And so, God, just reveal that to me. Let the Holy Spirit just speak to me, even, even, even right now. And, and, and hear, hear the word recalibrate, recalibrate, recalibrate. So even in this time of worship, I just pray that you would recalibrate into that perfect relationship with Christ. Let me challenge you with this. When Bobby starts singing, a lot of us are going to be tempted just to step up and start our worship time. And I'm going to ask that you not do that as quickly as you should. That maybe you would just pause and, 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 and let, them, let them sing. Even worship team, if this is you, uh, let Bobby sing by himself. That's fine. Let him play by himself if you need to. That's fine too. But maybe the Lord would ask you in this time just to, just to, just to bow your head and maybe even your body where you are. 
You might want to come up to these stairs and pray to the Lord about your relationship with, with, with him. You might want to stay seated there in your personal altar and say, God, I'm not standing up until we deal with this in my own life. If you want to talk to somebody about that, I'd be very happy to be up here to talk with you about that. If, and, and we won't put you on display. We'd love just to sit down with you and speak. Or you may know somebody else. Maybe you have a friend that's near you or a spouse that's near you and say, look, we've got to pray through some of this uh, this morning. We can't let this go. Maybe you find in the midst of this that you are at odds with somebody in the room. Man, don't let it, let, don't let it go. go. Go over to them and say, look, let's talk right now. Let's get this thing worked out because I'm drifting. I'm drifting right now. I need to get back. Father, will you take control of this room? You are our true north. You are our center, God, and you bring us back. Bring us back to where we need to be. Help us deal with our drift. In Jesus' name we pray. So as the Lord is moving in your life, you do as God shares with you to do. I'll be standing.